We have speaking for us this hour, Brother Danny Douglas. As with other speakers, we do look forward to hearing him. He will be uh, dealing with the subject, Christ Confronted Hypocrisy. Danny, you only have 40 minutes. That's uh, not enough time to deal with hypocrisy that not only Christ dealt with, but that we deal with today, not only in the brotherhood, but in the world in general. We are glad to have Brother Danny with us. He is a native of Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. He has been preaching the gospel on a regular basis since 1977. He has served churches of Christ in Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, and Virginia. And he has done full-time mission work in the Ukraine and the United Kingdom. He worked in public education for about 10 years, where he served as a teacher, a principal, and a college instructor, and now is involved in business. He has preached over the radio now for over 20 years and is a teacher with Truth Bible Institute. And I'll stop him on his bow just for a moment and say that we do appreciate all of our instructors for Truth Bible Institute. We just had a faculty meeting during the lunch hour. We have some new things that we're trying to start doing, and it's exciting to know the things that we can do, and we're, we appreciate Brother Danny and the work he does for Truth Bible Institute. He is currently the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, and is an insurance broker. He's also involved in the work of the Lord in the Philippines. He takes trips there every what, couple of years, I guess now, Brother Danny, every two or three years, and he's doing a good work there as well. He's blessed with the faithful support of a dedicated wife, uh, helping him do the Lord's work. They're also blessed with two children, and we look forward to hearing Brother Danny speak to us. So Brother Danny, come this time. Thank you, Brother John. I appreciate the good prayer and the singing a while ago. It is a privilege to be here. Uh, I have a scripture to begin with this morning, and it's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And it is, let us not sleep as do others. In other words, I know that after lunch, sometimes at this time of the day, that uh, we might get a little bit sleepy, and that's understandable. But it is good to be here, and uh, I also look forward to being with Brother McClish, and I want to say this, I certainly love and appreciate it, Sister Levine, what a wonderful, godly woman, an example that she was, and of course, our memory and her influence lives on, and truly love and appreciate her and Brother Dub also, and my family and I, the Lord willing, look forward to being with the North Point Church of Christ in Denton beginning the last day of March and going into April, Sunday through Wednesday, uh, in a few weeks away. And please pray for us in that. I hope that maybe some of you will be able to come up during that time. Some have already said they were going to come, and we look forward to, and I am thank the Lord for their support and help at North Point and also... Uh, Spring has helped us, and the church at Huntsville has helped us, where Brother Bruce is, and as a new congregation, and help, help support us. And we appreciate the support we received from the brethren. You know, I heard a story one time about a farmer who was going around in the community and telling everybody about all the hypocrites that were in the church. Well, the preacher got tired of that, so one day he went out to Farmer Brown, we would just say, and he told Farmer Brown, I want to buy one of your pigs. And uh, I don't think you was kidding to Brother David, but anyway, it's a fictitious story. Uh, it may be true, I don't know, but he went out to the uh, hog pen, and he saw the litter of hogs there, and uh, he saw a runt over there in the corner. He said, that's the one I want to buy. So he bought that pig, and he took it back to town. He said, hey, everybody, look at what kind of hogs Farmer Brown raises. Well, you know, a lot of people treat the church like that. They want to pick out a person that is not faithful or worldly. And by the way, we need to deal with those kind of people. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, withdraw from those who walk disorderly. That is, out of step with the word. That's the idea there. In 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. But our topic of this hour is to deal with Christ confronting hypocrisy. And I had planned to end the lecture with this, but rather I think I'm going to begin it with this. 
And that is the way to be sure that we are not hypocritical. And that is to have the mind of Christ, Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Now, there's a reason for that. If you look at hypocrisy, it is born of selfishness, self-centeredness, per desire for personal gain, or trying to get out of sacrifice and obedience. It all goes back to selfishness, self-centeredness. And the very epitome of one who was not self-centered is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, my beloved friends, if we will follow the Lord in his mind, we will not be hypocrites. And not only that, we will be saved in heaven one day. Look at what Paul said here in Philippians 2, beginning at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, before we move on in just a moment, and again, I meant to say again, I want to thank the Lord's Church and the elders here and Brother Brown and all the faithful members of this congregation for this lectureship. Most of all, thank the Lord. But we have examples of that mind here in this congregation and among faithful brethren here today who unselfishly serve. Christ's mind was a mind of servitude, sacrifice, service, obedience, humility, and a willing to suffer. And that is the mind that we must have, and if we're willing to do that, we will not be hypocrites. We will be pure and sincere. And Paul said, let love be without dissimulation, that is hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. I don't believe that the last part of that verse is disconnected from the first either. Those today in the brotherhood who refuse to abhor the evil, the evil of compromise and false doctrine, and I mean all of it, even if it's on the part of so-called respected well-known brethren or well-known or highly financed brotherhood projects and schools, it makes no difference. We are to abhor evil wherever we may see it and to cleave to that which is good. But now let's look at hypocrisy in a more detailed fashion. Thayer says that hypocrisy refers to a stage actor or a stage player from hypocrisy. The word means acting under a feigned part that is deceitfully. In the King James, it is translated condemnation, dissimulation, and hypocrisy, according to Strong. And one of the things that we are to lay aside and to put away are hypocrisies, according to 2 Peter 2 and verse 1. But many times a principle or a word is defined or understood more clearly by looking at an example of it. So let's go to John chapter 12, and we will see... An example of hypocrisy. This was on the part of Judas. He had criticized Mary for anointing the Lord with this uh, precious ointment. And uh, Judas feigned to have concern for the poor here. The Bible says, Then saith one of his disciples, verse number 4 beginning, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This said he not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then the Lord went on to commend this godly woman Mary. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my bearing, as she kept this for the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Well, the Lord already knew, he knew right then what was in Judas' heart. Because John 2.25 says that he knew what was in man. But notice the hypocrisy on the part of Judas. He was pretending to have concern for those in poverty, but his real concern was for the financial welfare of Judas. He was concerned about his own self-centered ends. Now when we turn to Matthew 2, we have another example of hypocrisy. And this time it was on the part of a king, King Herod. 
When they heard that he was born that was king of the Jews, Herod and all Jerusalem were concerned alike, and the wise men came to him. And he told them that when you have found him, let me know, so I may come and worship him also. But you know, Herod's concern was not to go and worship Jesus. He wanted to find the child Jesus so he could destroy him. And we remember how that God warned those wise men against this later on in Matthew chapter 2. As we read, And being warned of God and dreamed that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way in verse 12. And so Herod was hypocritical. He pretended that he wanted to go and worship Jesus, but he didn't want to worship Jesus at all. He wanted to destroy Jesus. He was a hypocrite. But then we come to Jesus Christ and dealing with the Jewish religious leaders. This is one of the greatest examples of the Lord dealing with hypocrisy was among the leaders among the Jews. At least 14 times he referred to them in the English King James as hypocrites in Matthew chapter 16, 22, 23, Mark chapter 7, Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 12, and Luke chapter 13. This time I would like to go to Luke chapter 13. We see a flagrant example of hypocrisy. And this was in a synagogue ruler. He responded with indignation after Jesus healed a woman who was in need of healing. And beginning at verse number 10 we read, And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity eighteen years, and was bowed together, and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him, and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, and them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite! Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to, wa to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. The synagogue ruler was not really pious in that concern about the Sabbath day. He said one thing and meant another. Oh, he might have had some concern about the Sabbath. But that was not the real motivation behind this, and the Lord knew it. He called him a hypocrite. But he envied Jesus and meant to rebuke the Lord. Now sometimes people don't always reveal their real motives when they bring up a charge or a criticism. There's something else behind it. That often have, happens with people. He pretended to have a pious interest in the observance of the Sabbath day, but was insincere. When people are envious, prejudiced, and hypocritical, they are also cold and callous. This man lacked love and concern over this woman who may have been a frequent worshiper in that particular synagogue. Now the Lord taught there, well, taught through Paul in the first part of 1 Corinthians 13, that even if we give our body to be burned and have not love, it does not profit us anything. And so this man didn't really have concern for that woman, but he had something against the Lord. And many times, hypocrisy is prompted of pride and envy and prejudice and, again, selfishness. Then we see that mere lip service is hypocrisy. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 to 9, this is another Flagrant example that the Lord pinpointed among the scribes and the Pharisees. These were supposed to be leaders among the Jews. In Matthew 15 and verse 7 beginning, 
Jesus said, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh to me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Their worship was not sincere, it was not earnest. For one thing, they followed the doctrines of men. And that within itself is hypocrisy uh, when people choose man's way over God's way, pretending to worship God. And you know, people today in the brotherhood and those even in the religious world at large who pretend to love Jesus and love God, oh, we love Jesus, but don't think enough of the Lord to follow his teachings. Friends, that's hypocrisy. That's what it is. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14 and verse 15. But now at this time, I would like for Saul to turn to Matthew, the seventh chapter. And, uh, you know, one thing I'd like to say while we're turning over there to Matthew chapter 7, the first five verses. One thing I want to get into this uh, lesson is that there are a lot of people they like to blame hypocrites for their own disobedience or unfaithfulness. And I'm sure we've all been through that. Especially we as preachers, and we've tried to reach people. Oh, well, you know, that woman over there, that congregation, I know how she lives. Or that man, I know how he is. Why, well, I'm just as good as they are. You know, a brother in the church one time brought this illustration out. He said, if you were out drowning in a lake and three hypocrites in a boat came along and threw you a rope, wouldn't you take it? <laughs> Would you take it? And another brother brought this point out. He said, that when you hide behind a hypocrite, you're saying that he is bigger than you. How else could you hide behind him? And so we cannot hide behind the hypocrites. Look at Judas, how he betrayed the Lord. And the Lord was delivered to be crucified. What if all the apostles had said, well, Judas is a hypocrite. Well, we might as well stop following the Lord too. Well, they all would have been lost had they done that. And so let's not allow a hypocrite to keep us out of heaven. And uh, moreover, if we are lost in eternal destruction in hell and we don't go to heaven then we're going to be in a place that's full of hypocrites for all of eternity. So if we make that excuse, well, there are hypocrites in the church, I don't like to be around hypocrites and all this, well, you better get ready to live with them because that's where you're going to be forever and not just for life's little day on this earth. But now in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged. And of course, I believe that's already been brought out in the lectureship that that's one of the most abused uh, commandments, or I know that we've heard it abused many times. Uh, in John 7, 24, the Lord commands us to judge. Judge righteous judgment. Judge not according to the appearance. So obviously, there are two kinds of judgment under consideration in Matthew 7, and one in John 7, 24. One is based on observing the fruits of a person. The Lord told us, in effect, that we have to discern fruits. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. How do we know a false teacher? We look at the fruits. What are they doing? What are they teaching? Is it according to God's word? How else can we detect a wolf in sheep's clothing if we don't look at the fruit? Now, Brother Marshall Keeble used to say, I'm just a fruit inspector. You know, we have to look at the fruits. But on the other hand, we have those who judge superficially and prejudicially or have an attitude of wanting to find fault. They're just looking and longing to find a fault in another person. You know, I've found that when there are people like that that are so desirous to find fault in others, then many times there's something in that closet of theirs that they are hiding or they don't want people to know about. But Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what measure ye, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, that is like speck, 
But consider not the beam, consider not the beam that is in thine own eye. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. You know, friends in the church, we need to take heed to these words. The Lord gave these words for a reason. Now certainly if our brother goes astray and errs from the truth, we are to restore such a one. According to Galatians 6 and 1 and James 5, 19 and 20, the Bible teaches that principle. We are to be concerned and we're to have enough love to go to people who fall into sin. But on the other hand, we are not to be hypocritical. You know, there are those who are always ready to see the wrong in others, but they don't look at their own selves. I heard or read the story one time about a baker who went to the judge and charged the farmer with cheating him. He accused the farmer for selling him a short pound of butter. And so when the farmer stood before the judge, the judge asked him, well, how do you weigh your butter? What do you use on the scales, on the balances? He says, well, I use the pound of bread I get from the baker. And so, you see, friends, it comes back on us when we have that kind of attitude and dishonesty. But now let's all turn to Matthew, the uh, 23rd chapter. I would encourage you to do that. We want to look at lessons here regarding the eight woes that Jesus pronounced against the scribes and the Pharisees. This is well known to us. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Let's look at these lessons here. There's first of all two things we want to consider before we get into each of the woes. The first one is that they say and they do not. Jesus taught, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not you after their works, for they say and do not. He declared there in verse number three. Now what they teach you that is right, yes, observe that, but don't follow their example. For they say one thing and they do another. And that's one thing that we as Christians, as members of the church, and all of us, preachers included, and elders, and every member, we have to be careful that we are actually practicing what we preach. That we're not hypocritical in that way. As we all know, there have been brethren in recent years that have uh, wrote and taught uh, sound doctrine regarding scriptural fellowship practice. And some of them still do teach it with their mouth. But yet they say and they do not. That's hypocrisy. But the second thing is the Lord unmasks their real motive here. The real motive that they had in verses 5 through 7. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. And I want to say this um, to all of us, and this is a danger even that preachers can fall into, and that is loving attention and the praise of men too much. And I want to say I love and appreciate the good and godly and sound brethren preaching here this week, but we have seen men in the brotherhood who fell prey to this very thing. They love the praise of men more than the praise of God, John 12, verse 43. And that's why many, of, some of them at least have refused to take an unpopular stand for the truth. You see, brethren, we can see these attitudes and these principles that the Lord laid down here. We can see it today among people. We can see it in the religious world. We can see it in the church. And, of course, we can see it in the government. Some of our governmental leaders. This thing of hypocrisy. This always leads to hypocrisy when we desire to please men more than to please God. 
And that goes back to Philippians chapter 2. Christ did not desire to please men more than God. For the Bible says in verse 8 of that chapter that he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The point is he was obedient to the Father's will. And we know that he prayed in the very shadow of the cross, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Matthew 26 and verse 39. And this is the way that we can be sure that we do not fall into the sin of hypocrisy. If we, like Jesus, strive to do what he always did, he said, I do always those things that please him, referring to the Heavenly Father in John 8, verse 29. And if we will always ascertain our hearts and motives on this basis, am I trying to please God and glorify Him? Am I striving to imitate Christ? Am I doing this foremost out of love for God, out of love which should be with all of heart, soul, mind, and strength, Mark 12 and 30? Am I seeking the highest good and the highest interest of my fellow man? Seeking the good of my fellow man. That's what true love is. That agape love that uh, Brother Chumley spoke so well about this morning. Yes, it is seeking the highest good of others. But now let's look at these woes. First of all, we see that hypocrites hinder souls from the kingdom. Oh, how true that is. It was true then, it's true today. In Matthew 23, in verse 13, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Just look at the many ways in which hypocrites hinder souls from going to heaven. There are those who hinder people outside of the body of Christ. By their inconsistent lives. Someone said, I cannot hear what you're saying because of what you are. You know, hypocrites in the church are one of the greatest hindrances to the growth of the cause of Christ. When we claim to love Christ, but people cannot see Christ living in us, that hinders the Lord's cause. Paul said, Spoke of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 Can people truly see Christ living in me? And as we all know, brethren, that hypocrites in the church, and by the way, this is no excuse for leaving the Lord, but we know that hypocrites in the church do cause people to stumble and fall. And we know this. And so, hypocrisy hurts the Lord and it hurts the church immensely. But now let's look at verse 14. Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Now, the Lord here is not necessarily condemning long prayers. For he himself went out into a mountain and continued all night in prayer unto God. In Luke 6 and verse 12. But these hypocrites wanted to be seen of men. They made these long prayers in order to make gain of others. To pretend to be so pious and righteous for their own personal gain. They made merchandise of religion and took advantage of unsuspecting souls. And the hypocrite again, he's out for himself. Again, this principle, selfishness leads to hypocrisy. Being selfish and self-centered and looking only out for ourselves, that's not the mind of Christ. And the greatest a deterrent to hypocrisy is to have the mind of Christ. What did Isaiah say about Christ? And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had no, done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah 53, 9. 1 Peter 2, 
Verse 22, he did no sin, neither was there guile or deceit in his mouth. The Lord had no guile, he had no deceit about him. And surely, when we follow his example, we are going to be pure and holy. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5, verse 8. But then, in verse 15, Warned you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him two far more of the child of hell than yourselves. They expend great efforts to win others to their side for personal advantage, but not to save them, but to have their own power and prominence and influence. They make people a son of hell, one worthy of eternal punishment. Moreover, the hypocrite claims to be a guide in that which is wise and right, but in reality, he is a display of ignorance. In Matthew 23, verse 16 and 17, Woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. So they had this system set up that where if you swore by the temple, you weren't really bound to keep that oath. But if you swore by an object in the temple, then yes, you had to keep that. Ye fools and blind, Jesus said, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. Now why would the part be greater and more important than the whole? But that shows how foolish and blind they were and how inconsistent they were they wanted the system to be able to escape the oaths that they gave. Now here's a very important point here. The hypocrite picks and chooses that part of God's law they, he would observe. Now friends, this is one of the most pertinent points today in regard to the church of our Lord in its present state and the brotherhood. Now just think about this. Aren't we seeing this whole thing among people today, even in our brotherhood, some of them, the, the ones we're talking about here, some of them have great prominence and influence and a following and have money behind them, like these scribes and Pharisees who were prominent. But you know, they're picking and choosing what they will obey and observe. And they will leave alone those things that are going to cause and incur upon them personal sacrifice and suffer. The scribes and the Pharisees didn't want to give up their positions of prominence. And we're seeing people today who are playing the hypocrite for that same reason. Let's look at verses 23 and 24. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe the men in anise and coming, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, and not to leave the other undone, ye blind guides which strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel. Now what did Jesus say? Can we just pick and choose what we will obey? He told the disciples, to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way even to the end of the world, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Paul said that he was pure and free from the blood of all men, Acts 20, 26. Why? Because he had not shunned or shrunk back from declaring the whole counsel of God, all the counsel of God. Now, there's another consideration here, an implication by this. If we are to observe and to declare and preach all the counsel of God, all that the Lord has commanded, all of the New Testament, and nothing left undone, that also implies, and think about this, it implies that we are to oppose all error. Anything that's contradictory to the all truth that the Spirit guided the apostles into, John 16, 13, anything that's contrary to the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, 27, and to all that the Lord has commanded, Matthew 28, 20, we are to oppose that. Whether it's marriage intent doctrine, children's church, reevaluation, reaffirmation of elders, 
uh, the deeper doctrine, the false teaching on the Holy Spirit, whatever it is, regardless of who it causes us to run across the grain of, we are to oppose that. We are not to pick and choose the error that we are to oppose. We are to oppose all of it. In Ephesians 5.11, we are to have no fellowship with your unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Well, let's move on here as our time is quickly going by. But number seven, in verse 27 and 28, we know it's that hypocrites often appear righteous unto men, but within are full of sin. Let's read this. Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are likened to whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Under Moses' law, whosoever touched a dead body was unclean for seven days, according to Numbers 19.16. Now the scribes and the Pharisees, they knew the old law. Indeed, they did. They were careful to whitewash the sepulchers of the dead. But no matter how beautiful these sepulchers might appear, they were still, still full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. And likewise, regardless of how these hypocrites might appear righteous unto men, they were still full of hypocrisy and iniquity and wickedness inwardly. God saw them for what they were, just as he sees all of us today, that all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do, Hebrews 4 and verse 13. But now let's look at verse 29 and 30 together. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Well, Jesus says, in effect, that you're dishonest, you're deceitful. That's hypo hypocritical. And the truth can be known here because of how they were treating the Lord. And how they treated other teachers of truth in their own day. That's exactly how they would have treated teachers of the truth in time past. So this was hypocrisy. The Lord said, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6, verse 46. But now, I want to get to this part here uh, right before we close. I'll see someone behind me. Brother John, didn't it? Uh, I want to look at this before we close. Now, do you and I think that we cannot fall into hypocrisy or dissimulation? You know, two of the greatest men of the Bible who ever lived fell into dissimulation. And I want to look at Galatians chapter 2 here for a moment before we close. I believe that's very important that we do. The thing about Peter and Barnabas is that they did not continue along the line, the life of hypocrisy. And their course of life was not hypocrisy. However, had they continued along the road of hypocrisy after this incident that we're going to read about, they would have ended up being like the scribes and the Pharisees who were hypocrites. But they did not continue along that course. Today, when brethren begin to play the hypocrite, or to compromise, that opens the door. They can either repent and turn back to God upon that, realizing their sin, or they will be set on the road of hypocrisy, dishonesty, and insincerity, as many have. Now let's read this in Galatians 2, 11 to 13. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation or hypocrisy. Here they were feigning to be concerned about upholding the law of Moses, 
But Peter well knew himself back to the house of Cornelius in Acts 10, 34 and 35, that God is no respecter of persons. He saw the vision of the clean, the unclean animals. When God said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat, he knew that God was accepting the Gentiles. But they fell into dissimulation. Now, last of all, I want to look to Luke chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And my friends, I know if men as great as Peter and Barnabas can fall into that, so can you and I. And Paul rebuked him to the face. And that's what we need to do today when brethren are guilty of public sin. In Luke 12, 1 and 2, and I want to close with this. It's interesting here, and it's something to really think about. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of the people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Leaven is something that spreads and is influential. Now, brethren, today, what about the brotherhood? Has hypocrisy and dishonesty not spread among many brethren that we've known of? It has influence. When people of, that are in leadership ability especially are guilty of hypocrisy, it influences others. And we need to be aware of this. And then Jesus said, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. And that's a major motivation for us to be open, honest, and sincere and obedient to the truth. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, Romans 2, verse 16. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Danny, for that fine lesson. I do appreciate the study that he gave us today about hypocrisy, something, as you mentioned, we have to be careful about, but we're seeing a lot of it in the world today. Before we do break for the next few moments, I do want to mention, uh, and this has been mentioned a few times this week, you want to sign up for the Contending for the Faith publication. It is free online. We do have sheets available uh, up here on the front, you can go to the website at the bottom of this sheet. Uh, like I said, they're on a table up here. Sign up, and I believe uh, David doesn't Philip have that at the bottom of the online. I think it's if you're watching this online, then you should see that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, sign up and contend for the faith online, and be able to receive that for free. We'll have about a 10 to 12 minute break, and be back in here at the bottom of the hour, and we'll begin our next session. <laughs>